This is Robert Glasscock, and I am very excited to tell you that I'm going to be in Chicago on July the 8th for an all-day seminar with the Friends of Astrology group in Chicago. For more information, friendsofastrology.org. And I hope to see you in Chicago. Welcome back to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast. I'm Thomas Miller along with Robert Glasscock. We're going to roll basically right in to the continuation of our last episode. We were answering a listener question and that turned into a conversation about quincunxes and now yods in this episode. So if you haven't heard the previous one, that's the setup for this one. And we're going to join our conversation back in progress for part two. Okay, let me ask you this about the yod. So we're talking about this aspect that has this mystique, and it also is something that has this dynamic of, you know, we've talked about the God-witch contrast, right? It's like this, the devil or the, or the saint, the angel. Is it structured in some kind of way with the sextile at the base and then the quincunxes that it does put an extra amount of pressure on psychosis or that it's like either I'm going to get this right and it's going to point me in a some kind of supernatural spiritual direction or I could flip out and just freaking go crazy with this thing. Is that that kind of aspect? I don't think so. I mean, it certainly has the potential for everything you just said, Thomas, but so do squares. So do oppositions. No more so than than the finger of God. I'm Once again, um, as I said in the last podcast, you can give wonderful names to these different configurations, the mystic cross, the grand, the grand cross, the mystic rectangle, the finger of God, the kite. And they're, and they're, they're great descript, very thumbnail descriptors. But in fact, if you simply think your way through any aspect that you see in the chart or any configuration, you can figure out what it means without having to try and, oh, what did so and so call this? And what did he say it means? Look at the aspect yourself. So in a finger of God, you got two planets in an opportunistic, expansive sextile and a third planet opposite the midpoint of that. And it's in conjunct both ends of the sextile. So that third planet is simultaneously going to frustrate each planet at the end of the sextile. But the sextile is giving you, a, it's telling you right up front, this is an opportunity here. But to make any change in your life takes frustration. Nobody moves a muscle without having a need of some kind, you know, to eat, to go to the bathroom, whatever it is. So the frustrations that are built into the finger of God, the inconjuncts from that third planet, it's the third planet that's opposite the midpoint of the sex. So it says, pay attention to this third planet. Pay attention to the house it's in. Pay attention to the house or houses that it rules, because when you begin to think through all these associations with this sextile going on, you're going to be able to figure out how to capitalize on this. And it very well may, the finger of God, the configuration very well may indicate a special talent that you have. Now, to actualize it, will probably take a lot of effort because nothing comes easy that's worth getting for one thing and second of all if if the finger of god is pointing out some special talent or unique individual uh, brilliance that you have or originality almost by definition it's going to be a little more difficult for you to actualize that than to go get a job at Wendy's. So the finger of God does confer a lot of times, pay attention to this, because this may be a specialty of yours or a special perspective that you have on the, or a special type of vocation or and so on. So it can be a wonderful aspect to have. Okay, another question on this, and this is a little bit of a word picture, but think think the witch's hat, because that's the best graphic here. So not implying that we're on the devil's side of the aspect at the moment. That's just a, the visual. So you have the pointed top. You have that planet at the top. And then you have these two long inconjuncts or quincunx sides leading to two planets down at the bottom. So it's a tall pyramid is basically what it is. If you brought that 
if you brought a line, if you hung a plumb line down from that top planet, there's the midpoint on that line between the two sextile planets at the base, right? Straight down. There's the midpoint. Is that degree, whatever sign and degree that is, is that a hot spot in here as well? Yes, sir, because it's exactly opposite the planet that's forming the end. So it's, so yeah, you're synthesizing all of it. And I'll, since you bring up midpoints again, Thomas, I do this uh, in my own mind with any hard aspect in my own chart or anybody else's. If I have a grand cross, for example, well, let's not even talk, just take a square in your own chart. Squares inherently are conflict. They are meant to be in conflict. You chose them to be in conflict. Don't forget metaphysically spiritually this is no accident that you are in physical reality this is something your soul chooses of its own accord and you can say well bad things happen well bad things do happen to animals to trees to people if they do but nonetheless that square aspect that you're born with is meant to frustrate you into doing something to resolve the conflict that you're born with or born into that will show up in something like a square. Well, with any hard aspect, a square, an inconjunct, an opposition, look at the midpoint between the two planets. They're in the hard aspect because the midpoint axis, so it's going to be two houses and two signs because it'll be an axis. But the midpoint between any two planets in conflict will give you a solution point. That axis by house, by sign, and by the opposite sign. There's the axis on it. Do you see what I, is this clear? Oh yeah, mentally. Okay. Yes, it is. So it's a the, the midpoints are so that your question absolutely it's important because that will be a part of the solution. In other words, with the finger of God, you have an opportunity here to to grow and exploit, if you will, in a constructive way. It's the the frustrations built in with the inconjuncts. Pay attention to those too, but to resolve them, look at that midpoint and its axis, the opposite sign too, to see a house axis that will play a part in resolving that finger of God and fully realizing the growth opportunity underneath it in that sextile. Love that. And you've done a lot of work. You've had a long-standing relationship with Kepler College, and they did a webinar. It was a free webinar, but it's on their YouTube channel, if you could just go to Kepler College. And Kathy Rose was the instructor on this, and it was about midpoints. But we talked about this a couple of episodes back, and I mentioned that she talked about the midpoint between the sun and the moon, the midpoint between the luminaries as being a really specially activated point in the chart. and I've, I love that. I, love, I love it, too. I've put it on my chart now, so it's on everything. And, yep. oh, my gosh, is that incredible. I mean, yep. yeah, so you look at that, and then that's the synthesis between yourself and your soul. It's just beautiful. See, and what she's – I love hearing that because what she's hitting on is the, the value of midpoints. You can do it with any aspects. You can do it with trines, planets and trines. You can find the midpoint of that. Any pair of planets, they have a midpoint. And whether they're in aspect or not, they have a midpoint. But especially the planets in aspect and maybe especially the ones that are in hard aspects, those are the ones where you have conflicts built in, either internal conflicts or they're external conflicts that you have to deal with. But the midpoint axis to that hard aspect will often give you tremendous clues and directions to follow in order to resolve the conflict to your own best self-fulfillment. And I don't mean that in a selfish way. I'm talking about fulfilling being whole. That's what I'm talking about, holistically. I want to answer a question that I know is coming from a lot of people right now. How do I find that episode? Well, it's Kepler College's YouTube, so I we don't manage that. But the thing was about, I'm going to say, April or May, April probably 2023. So look in the range there on the Kepler College YouTube channel. It was great. Kathy Rose was the instructor. So one other question, I know sometimes there are two planets on, or more even, you could have three, on one of the points or more. So what do you do with multiple planets across a yod? 
you read it exactly like you read any other aspect in the chart. You know, when, when you're talking about these configurations like the yod or the kite or all of those things, the mystic rectangle, that sounds, ooh, a mystic rectangle. Well, it is statistically. It's not rare, but it's very unusual. Uh, the Grand Cross is another one. These these names give these configurations a mystique that they don't deserve. All aspects are important, every single one of them. And they all can interrelate with each other. So to isolate one, so this is more important than this one. Uh, now, you can certainly rate the strengths of planets and aspects by their angularity, for example, by whether they're in signs of exaltation or fall, you can begin to weigh and particularize different aspects. So when you're talking about a yod, do you have an example that you were... Yeah, you, know, you have a clump of planets. It's at three, at three planet, two, three, let's say, at one point of the sextile, I think you're talking about, right? Yeah. It could be at any point in the yod, though. It could be the fulcrum planet. Well, let's do one with a with a couple. All right, so let's put... Well, right now, Venus and Mars are conjunct so let's put venus and mars at the top okay all right and then let's put saturn which is now in retrograde at one of the sextile points at the bottom and let's do one of the luminaries let's do either the sun or the moon at the bottom let's do the moon at the bottom all right so if it's the moon sextile saturn you're talking about emotional stability financial stability domestic stability all everything connected with the moon the home the family property uh, uh, financial security but it's an emotion it's an aspect about it. emotional uh, structure if you will with saturn and commitments emotional commitments so marriage is a big one and then you have venus and what did you say mars yeah, let's put Venus and Mars up there. All right, Venus and Mars are male and female and sex and marriage and love and, and all of that. They're also business planets. You can take it in a couple of contexts here, the same aspect, depending on where the odd or yod falls, you know, housewives in the chart. But nonetheless, Mars and Venus are very much male and female planets. You've got the moon involved, which is women and emotions and feelings, sextile Saturn. That configuration is looking for a lifelong marriage, they will have trouble finding it because of the inconjuncts from Mars and Venus, men and women, love and marriage, sex. That's the fulcrum point. Depends what sign they're in, but nonetheless, that's those energies. And those energies of love and sex and marriage, Mars and Venus, which also tie into work and security, they are in conjunct Saturn, which is a person's structure of life, their status in life. Well, the status in life is in conjunct love and marriage in that configuration. So their marriage may suffer from their work requirements with the Saturn sextile of the moon. Often will indicate someone who, and if it's a woman which is the moon, so much the better. But either way, man or woman, they will tend to identify with their work emotionally a lot. They, they tend to like their work and to be good at their work. But their work and demands of their work can take them away from the love and marriage. The partner, she, if it's a woman, may feel a little second place to the work in that same configuration. So that configuration points to the possibility, especially with age and maturity, of ultimately finding that kind of lasting marriage that they want. Sometimes in a different, a different position in the chart, Thomas, that same configuration, that same yod, can indicate loss of the partner, a beloved partner. They may be married for, you know, X number of years, depending on what the chart in case but they could have a long marriage and then one or the other partner could so it could indicate the loss of a spouse in that way as well as through divorce but so it it tends to indicate a life where the search for that kind of ideal love and family and home and domestic security 
is a real strong issue with them, but one that will be frustrating, especially up through the first 42 years. And after that, sometimes these people decide to just go through life uh, never marrying again. But other of them, I have a dear friend who has this a similar configuration. She's been married four times. She's a Taurus. She loves being married. And it, it's... It, it's a genuine need. And the, the men that have been married to her, especially the last couple, because she is getting older, they've needed her care. And she's happy to do it. Now, that, see how different people live there. I don't know if that explains that, yo, that you're talking about. Oh, I there, think but, it was great to okay, walk through okay. as an example. Yes, thank you. No, that But was, that's how you read any configuration. You don't have to sit there, oh, my God, this is a yod. What do the books have to say? You don't need it. Think about I me. Mean, of course you do to learn. But you, if you just think, what are the energies? What do they represent? Are they in a harmonious aspect? Are they in a conflicting aspect? Well, yeah, just think it through. Takes a little work. Oh but yeah. Boy, is there, but it, it is rewarding. A little bit of training too. That's great. Robert, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating conversation, these last two episodes. Thank you. Well, thank you. Hey, if you'd like to talk to Robert, maybe you have one in your chart and you still would like to know more. Check out the show notes for the direct link to be able to book him for a reading and then all of our other stuff. And by the way, our Discord channel is just growing and growing. So if you would like to get in there, there's a direct uh, link of, well, basically you can go to the top of the funastrology.com website and that's the bit best place or easiest place to get to Discord. But Kristen Lawhead is in there and taking questions. So if you still have a question about your chart, we can't get to all of my chart has this and that in the podcasts, but she can in there. Plus, there's a great team of people who are loving sharing these readings and giving their opinions on the charts as well. So that's our Discord channel, funastrology.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time on the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock.